Um, so over the next 48 hours, we're going to engage four times in all with sections of 2 Corinthians. There's nothing quite like this letter in all the writings of St. Paul, it seems to me. It's quite unlike 1 Corinthians, unlike Philippians, unlike the two letters to the Thessalonians, unlike Galatians, all of which I assume were written before this one. It's unlike those others in tone, and in particular, in the searing honesty with which Paul bears his soul. Our four engagements with the letter will only touch the first five chapters, and even then you won't be getting a sustained exposition. So you've been provided with what at first glance seems to me to be a very reasonable interpretation of the whole letter in the Grove booklet by John Proctor, a letter of integrity which was in your goodie bag, and I've provided on the table uh, before you my own overview of the letter which I also hope might be um, useful to at least some of you. And some of you will already have worked out that I preached from 2 Corinthians at the service of installation uh, last September and again at the Chrism Eucharist in the Cathedral Church in Holy Week. I can't swear that the Lord is trying to tell you something. It's perfectly possible that he's just trying to tell me something. Uh, but I have chosen this text of 2 Corinthians because I meant what I said in my sermon, sermon at the Chrism Eucharist. It is an uphill struggle to be a lay or ordained minister in the Church of England at present. You're overworked, and if you're paid at all underpaid, overstretched and underappreciated, you will see your calling ridiculed in the media as either humorless or laughable. You'll see your institution singled out for criticism, sometimes rightly, sometimes not, and not only in relation to safeguarding. For many of you, I know the wounds of the vacancy in C are still raw, and added to that, pretty much every day since you first embraced your vocation, you have come face to face with what I have been calling the four-headed beast. You've been challenged pretty much week in, week out in your parishes by unwelcome trends in relation to attendance figures, budgets, church structures, and demographic profiles A, B, C, D. So these are difficult days in which to exercise leadership lay or ordained in the Diocese of Sheffield. But that doesn't mean that all I've got to offer you is blood and toil, sweat and tears. This is why I have chosen to root these Bible readings in 2 Corinthians. Of all the letters of St. Paul, this is the one in which the context is one of adversity. At one point in the passage we've just heard, he says, referring to what has happened to him in Ephesus, we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly, unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. Friends, I don't know what you would do if someone for whom you have pastoral charge said that they were feeling so utterly unbearably crushed as to despair of life itself. I would wonder if the speaker was depressed. In my role, I would probably be wondering if I needed to refer them to the new church's ministerial counselling service or perhaps to write a cheque out of my discretionary account to offer some help with a retreat or a short holiday. For my own edification at the moment, I'm reading Tom Wright's new uh, biography of Paul. I heartily recommend it. He places considerable weight on this crisis in Paul's life when he suffered a double whammy, uh, the breakdown of his relationship with the church in Corinth, but also a very severe persecution in Ephesus. Adversity in the place to which he was writing and adversity in the place from which he was writing. I hadn't really grasped the impact of that coincidence of trouble uh, on Paul's sense of his own well-being under God, but Tom Wright makes a very compelling case in my view. But the extraordinary thing about this letter is that it is not downbeat. It is utterly frank, as we'll see, about the extent of the distress in which Paul finds himself. There's no attempt on his part to airbrush his testimony, no denial, no pretense, no papering over the cracks. The letter is, as I say, searingly honest. But it is also hopeful and thankful and full of grace and generosity, and that's why it seems to me to be a helpful focus for our time together. 
As you'll see from the handout, I want to say something about the greeting in verses 1 and 2, something about the blessing or thanksgiving in verses 3 to 7, and then something finally about Paul's testimony in verses 8 to 11. The greeting then, first of all. And by the time I left Liverpool, which incidentally is exactly a year ago this coming Friday, people there had started to chuckle when they heard me use the following sentence, because I use it so often. Holy Scripture is, of course, always more than carefully crafted literature, but it is seldom less than that. And I'll say it again so that you can quickly get used to chuckling at me too. Of course, Holy Scripture is always more than carefully crafted literature, but it is seldom less than that. And this greeting is a case in point. Just look at the pairings. The letter is not just from Paul. It is from Paul and Timothy. It's from two of them because the, Paul, because the Apostle knew that Christian leadership is best shared, best plural, because the Holy Spirit has been poured out plurally on each and every one of us who has been baptised into Christ. So the letter is from Paul and Timothy. And it's not just to the church in Corinth. It's also to the saints, the people of God, throughout the province of Achaia. That includes the church in Athens, for example, but also the church in Kencre, just down the road from Corinth, where the deacon was a woman called Phoebe. Just by the way, I've also bought, but not yet started reading, the new work of historical fiction by Paula Gooder called Phoebe. Given the calibre of the author, I expect the study to be outstanding. So it's from Paul and Timothy to the churches of Corinth and Achaia. And the letter bears not just grace, but also peace. Grace to you and peace, it says. Grace, charis, an interesting little twist on the traditional classical first century Greco-Roman letter greeting, which was karain. Karain means rejoice or I wish you joy. If we're right to date this letter to around 54 AD, then Paul has been writing letters like this for a decade. He's had plenty of time to refine this greeting and to judge by his consistency, he quickly settled on this version. Karain becomes charis. It allows Paul to start where salvation starts, with grace. It allows Paul to start where his theology starts, with grace. It allows Paul to start where everything starts, with grace. But to the Greco-Roman charis, he adds the Hebrew greeting shalom, peace. And you could say that his whole theology is encapsulated in those three words, grace and peace. Salvation is rooted in grace, but it issues in eschatological peace, in harmony, well-being, Sabbath rest. So Paul and Timothy write to Corinth and Achaia with grace and peace. From whom? From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm persuaded that this is a reference, however subtle, to the Jewish Shema in Paul's thought. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, has become the Lord our God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ are one. It's an extraordinary move for a zealous, Torah-observant Jew to make. But I'm convinced by the number of times in his letters in which Paul applies Old Testament texts which are about Yahweh, the Lord, to Jesus, the Christ, that that is indeed what is going on here. And that's just the first two verses. What a beautifully crafted greeting. So let me go on, um, secondly, to verses 3 to 7, to what you might call either the blessing or the thanksgiving. The words are um, pretty much equivalent in both Greek and Hebrew. What I want to emphasize here is how quickly Paul acknowledges the real context into which and out of which he is writing. In these five verses, you'll see ten references to consolation. And what a telling word that is. Consolation is what is necessary when there is sorrow. You don't need to be consoled in victory, only in defeat. You don't need to be consoled at the birth of a grandchild, only at the death of a grandparent. You don't need to be consoled when your hopes are realized, only when they're dashed. So there is a giveaway right there. But Paul is explicit. He joins the dots up for us. He's writing out of and into a situation of affliction and suffering. You'll find the word affliction four times, the word suffering also four times in just five verses. So I think we're clear. 
Paul is writing at a time when his ministry is a burden to him. It's not plain sailing. Apostleship is not for Paul at this point a walk in the park. And yet, and yet the first word in this second section is blessed. Ulogetos. Literally, I suppose, good be spoken of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Praise be to God. Blessed be God. Good be spoken of God. And the last word in this section, pretty much, is hope. You'll see that's a bridge, effectively, into the final section to which we'll turn in a moment. But you'll see that word in verse 7. Our hope for you is unshaken. And between those two words, blessed and hope, is another one which occurs twice. Abundant. Look at verse 5. Just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so our consolation is abundant through Christ. Paul's mindset, in spite of his circumstance, is not one of scarcity, but of abundance. The abundance, the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, he says, and we can say the same. Our consolation is abundant through Christ, he says, and we can say the same. Friends, I am very much a novice bishop. Twelve months ago, as I say, I was still living in Liverpool. And novelty, in my experience, does bring a free path with respect to strain and stress. You will know this yourself if you can remember the last time you took up a new post. In my own experience, it's generally about two years before the full weight of responsibility and expectation really bear down. But if in 2020, or thereabouts, it should seem to you that I am looking careworn, if it should seem to you that I'm living out of scarcity, whether that's the energy scarcity of my own self, quite possibly, or the financial scarcity of the SDBF, also quite likely, would one of you please be kind enough to remind me that God does not dwell in scarcity. God is abundant. The Holy Spirit is abundant. The sufferings of Christ are abundant. And my consolation is abundant through Christ. And that brings me finally to verses 8 to 11, which I've called Paul's testimony. I have to say that if one of you wrote in your parish magazine forward, if you still have such a thing, or on your latest blog post, that you were feeling so utterly unbearably crushed that you despaired of life itself, I might think that was too much information for your parish magazine or your blog post. But actually, in these four verses, what Paul shares with his readers is not his despair, but his hope. And yet he does it without, as I say, airbrushing, crack-papering, denying or pretending that his circumstances are anything other than tough. He writes out of and into adversity, and he does not affect otherwise, but he does his theology. If you're truly dead, he notes in verse 9, if you have been baptized into the death of Christ, then you cannot rely on yourself. Dead people don't. The opposite of faith, it turns out, is not doubt, but self-reliance, self-assertion. Dead people don't assert themselves. Those who have received the sentence of death, Paul says, are utterly cast, utterly cast on the mercy of God, the God who raises the dead. The resurrection of Jesus has already become, for Paul, by the mid-50s AD, a paradigm. He speaks not of the God who raised his son from the dead, he speaks of the God who routinely raises the dead. That's what the resurrection of Jesus demonstrates. 
and exemplifies. And the one who has, through Christ, rescued us from the greatest peril which any human has to face, the peril of death itself, will, Paul trust, continue to rescue us. On him, he says, we have set our hope, our hope that he will rescue us again. Isn't that wonderful? Because of Easter, because of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, we Christian people are always people of hope. And if that wasn't enough, we also have the encouragement and support and effective help, this is verse 11, of the prayers of our brothers and sisters. Which issue in what? Not in Paul's account, in his own deliverance. The prayers of the people of God offer effective help and issue in thanksgiving and blessing. Actually, the word translated blessing in the NRSV is simply charis, grace. So we're back where we began. Hope, thanksgiving, grace. That's my prayer for these few days. That the God who raises the dead will renew us in hope and thanksgiving and grace. Amen.